Good morning. I'm glad everyone could make it here this morning. Who has? Um, this service is being live streamed. So if you're not in person, you can be in the parking lot or on the internet and view this worship service and participate. Um, there's 88.7 FM is where you can tune in on the radio. The uh, Church of Christ sponsored Search TV program is on a lot, and those are some really good programs. Uh, Sunday morning class at 9.30 with Vincent. One of the things I learned this morning in Judges where we were ending up is uh, if we repent, God will ease our burdens. I guess that's the best way I can put it right away. Um, that was that was that was a good lesson, Vincent. Thank you. Um, youth classes with Jiwu, simple Christianity. Uh, Wednesday adult class, adult teen class on Romans with Jiwu at 7 p.m. Check the e bulletin for links on how to get to those classes. Uh, it's now authorized to for congregational singing. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, please wear your face mask. Uh, three minute Thursdays, uh, devotionals from Don and Jiwoo. Uh, the videos are on, posted on Facebook each week. Uh, Don begins a new Wednesday night class on the 14th entitled Defending the Faith. Our scripture reading is going to be from John chapter 11, verses 17 through 21. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to assemble this morning. We pray that our hearts and minds will be in tune to your word. Help us, Lord, to learn and grow in your word and to continually share your word with others around us. We pray, Lord, for those unable to attend that wish to, and we pray that these obstacles that are hindering them can be removed. Help us, Lord, always in our search and our study to grow closer to you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you'd like to turn, well, we don't have songbooks anymore, do we? Uh, if you want to look up behind me and I'll look behind you, uh, we're going to sing If That Isn't Love, 379. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny. Was a lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me? If that is a love, the ocean is dry, there's no stars in the sky. There's no feeling 
like this if that is love even in death he remembered the thief hanging by his side he spoke with love and compassion then he took him to paradise if that isn't love then heaven the ocean is dry there's no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly, if that isn't love, then heaven's a there's no feeling like this, if that isn't Today, throughout the world, people are remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I praise God for that. And yet, sadly, many believe today's the only day to do that. This is the time of the year that they call Easter, and they say we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Well, we know from the scriptures that first century Christians met together each Sunday, each first day of the week to celebrate that. Jesus instituted this, and the Gospels tell us, by saying, take and eat of this bread, it represents my body, and the fruit of the vine represents the blood that I'm going to shed, and I'll not take it again until I take it with you in the kingdom of God. And of course, after he died and was resurrected, then the kingdom was established, and he did do so. But we're told as Christians that we certainly need to remember because it is so important. So electronic devices are wonderful if they work. I had this all set up and now it's not here. Give me a second, I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to get my Bible and we'll read it that way. First Peter, the first chapter, please. Beginning in the second half of verse 17. Live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. We are here today because our faith and hope is in God. And as we take of these emblems, let's remember the sacrifice of Christ. But let's also remember that he is a resurrected and living savior he's at god's right hand so at this time as we take the bread if you'll bow with me in prayer heavenly father we thank you for the fact that jesus willingly came to earth that it was foreordained that he would do so to suffer and die on the cross he gave of his body we're thankful that we're told that when he was resurrected 
the church became his body and we are the spiritual body of Christ today. As we take this bread, we'll pray that we'll remember the importance of the body of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now we prepare to take the fruit of the vine. If you will again bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, that blood that he shed on the cross, the blood that cleanses sins. We're thankful that we're told that that blood continues to work in our lives daily if we walk in the light. And we pray that we will walk in the light so that blood will cleanse our sins and we can approach you as pure and sinless. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Now as a matter of convenience, not part of the communion service, but Christians also were told on the first day of the week to lay by in store. That is to give as they had been prospered. And so we have the opportunity to give. There is a box on the wall there as you exit this auditorium that you can place your contribution there or there are ways to pay online or you can mail or bring your uh, offering to the, to the church office. As you see fit, there are many ways. But let's thank God for our blessings and that he will bless our giving. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many things that you've given us, especially Jesus Christ. But we know, Father, that we are told that we need to learn the joy of giving. Just as Jesus gave of himself and you give us so many blessings, we have opportunities to give. And we pray that you would bless us, that we would give as you've taught us cheerfully and as we've been prospered. And we are so prospered, Father. And so we pray that you will bless the gifts that are given at this time for the use of this congregation here and throughout the world, that we would use your monies in the right way so that we would further your kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then if you would, uh, we're going to sing, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded, is our next song. O Sacred Head, Now Wounded, With grief and shame weighed down, Now scornfully surrounded, with thorns thine only crown. How art thou pale with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn? How does that visage languish with was bright as morn. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, if you could have your Bibles to John chapter 11, we're going to be there this morning. And uh, I just got to give you a disclaimer today. We're going to have a longer sermon than usual. But I hope that's okay with you to be with the Church of God here a little longer. So we're here together and praise the Lord. And before I begin, I would like to introduce to you a person very special to me. Um, I don't have a picture up there, but she's my grandmother. She was born in the year 1932 in Korea uh, during the Japanese imperial occupation when the Korean people were treated inhumanely. It's a kind of context that I cannot imagine living in as I was growing up in a country that was being prosperous and prospering continually. Her context was that of suffering as her life began. Can imagine today that education there had to be underground in secrecy, that she had to get it, uh, she had to learn how to read in secrecy and how to do basic mathematics underground. Thankfully, at the age of 13, with the US intervention, Korea was liberated from the Japanese occupation. However, at the age of 18, the Korean War broke out in, in the year 1950. At the age of a high school senior or a recent graduate, she had to suffer a forced removal from her, from her hometown. After the three years of war, she managed to find a soldier, a young Korean soldier, and she was married to him and had three children with him. Mm -hmm. However, at the age of 32, her husband abandoned her and her three children, one of whom were only an infant. Being a sacrificial mother, she became a street vendor to sell whatever she could with the basic mathematics she learned and the, the reading capacity that she had. And my mother recalls being young, this song that my grandmother used to sing every day as she went out. My mother doesn't know how she became a Christian, but this is a song, this is a hymn, a Korean hymn. And uh, the song goes like this. <laughs> And this first stanza, and having, if I translate that into English, it is something like, having been called, I shall go wherever or anywhere. Whether in pain or in joy, I shall follow only the Lord. So who shall stop me? Could even death. So who shall stop me? Could even death. Her sacrifice for her children, unfortunately, did not end, but continued on with her grandchildren. And from my earliest memories to my young adulthood, she was a big part of our lives. She lived with our family, and most of those years, I saw her on a daily basis. She fed her, she nurtured us, and she disciplined us. And I still remember when my family was just about to immigrate, she was left with my brother and I for several months just by ourselves, and she fed us while my, my, while my dad and my mom came to the United States to look for a home for us. I still look back to those days and wonder how much love she had for us. Yeah. It was only after the year 2014 when my parents went back to Korea that she was left in New Jersey with her eldest son. 
And it was only two years ago that she went into the nursing home. We all desired her last years to be that of comfort. Yet the world was cruel to her to her, to her last breath. Last year on June 18th of 2020, she passed away. In the nursing home after being in isolation for three months because of the COVID. And the nursing home didn't let our uncle know that she has contracted COVID during that time. And it was only the day that she has passed away that my uncle was notified. And I remember being on the plane the next day, trying to form a sermon for the memorial service that we were to have the following day. And if you ask me, I really didn't move on from that. I still remember her. I still grieve the fact that she had to go in isolation. Her memories and her faith has shaped me. She had taught me a great deal about what faith is, a great deal about what family is, a great deal about what parenting is. For me, grieving is a mixture of celebration of one's life and a deep sense of loss resulting from the fact that I cannot see her again. I cannot touch her again, hold her again, or hear her again. So why do I share this story with you today? I share this story because many of us here also have gone through the similar experience. Yeah. Stories of love and stories of loss. I would like to ask, did you move on? Do you no longer long to see them? I, th I think I already know the answer. We did not. I would like to say we do not move on from grief, but move forward with it in this world. I recently saw a TED talk by a lady named Nora McInerney. And she says this, we don't move on from grief, but we move forward with it. And I thought that was very insightful. And the example that she gives is this, we don't look at people around us experiencing life, joys and wonders and tell them to move on, do we? So for example, a birth of a child. We don't after five years of birthday celebration say, get over it. She's been born, do we? So why do we do that with grief? Why do we do that with grief? <laughs> to move on, if by, what, by that we mean that we no longer feel the loss in the state where we no longer long for our loved ones, if that is at all possible, is to make God's plan of resurrection not. Why is there a need for the resurrection if you no longer need to see our loved ones? or want to see them. And I, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Bible, there is a command to forget about our loved ones once they die. I don't think there is such a command. To move on may also mean that we have succumbed to the power of death and became as helpless subjects. That is, we have given up. You may say we are helpless before death. Death comes to everyone. In one sense, these statements are understandable. Death is very real. Death reigns in this world. Life is always eclipsed by death in this world. Yet in another sense, these are very unchristian-like statements. Are we people who rebel against death? Are we people who have been freed from its grips? We are people who believe that death has lost a sting and is powerless before God, that death is no more. So why do we see death? There is this dissonance. Why is there death of God? And we feel grief because deep inside we know that something is terribly wrong, that someone so precious can be taken from us. We are people who can envision eternity in life and imagines no death, yet death still brings a sudden halt to that imagination. It brings a sudden cliff to our path. 
and therefore we experience grief in this world. I'd like you to turn to John chapter 11 as you consider the evidence of scripture and consider the responses of Martha, Mary, and Jesus. The first thing that Mary, Martha says when she sees Jesus is the last verse that we read this morning together. And this is what she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha did not fully understand the work of Jesus about to be performed. However, she at the very least understood that Jesus was the anointed one of God and that God's healing power, the life force in God was channeled through him and that he, if he had been there before Lazarus had died off, then he could have been saved. Like, he didn't have to go into the tomb. She is bitter that Jesus did not come sooner and she's in the state of mourning. Now, if you turn to uh, verse 24, the same chapter, this is what Martha says. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she had this knowledge about the resurrection and the last day. However, the fact that not impede her from mourning the loss at the present moment. And it did not make her feel okay if nothing is wrong. If he turned to verse 22, she says this, yet even now I know that when, whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Amen. She wants something to be done now. She wants something to be done now. She doesn't think that Jesus can raise people from the dead. That is obvious if you read further down. Resurrection of the dead right now is outside of her imagination. Her brother's body was already decaying. Death seemed too real. Mm -hmm. Yet even still, the grief was too much that something had to be done. And she's asking Jesus to do whatever he can. Now consider Mary. Scripture is very clear that Mary was mourning when Jesus came to their town. And that is doubly made clear by what the people thought when Mary went out to meet Jesus. They thought that she was going to the tomb side to mourn there. So she was mourning. And look what her response is in verse 32. Turn to your Bible to verse 32. It's the exact same thing that Martha has said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We can also safely assume that Mary also knew about the resurrection in the last days. Yet that did not stop the mourning for the death of her brother at that present moment. Mary, like her sister, pleads before Jesus in her own way. Although she falls down before his feet and starts mourning. And we see that in verse 33, Mary and the Jews with her before uh, Jesus were weeping together. And seeing this, Jesus does not say that they were faithless. There is no indication that weeping and mourning were taken as signs of faithlessness by Jesus. Then what does Jesus do? Let's consider Jesus and his response. Now remember, Jesus had the patience that the death of Lazarus will be used by God to display the glory of God before even coming to the town of Bethany. Jesus also knew that God will raise Lazarus through him. And he, also, he does that. Yet that did not stop him in that moment from grieving for Lazarus. So in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. Yeah. Deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The Greek word translated as deeply moved into English has a connotation of strong anger. Jesus was furious Amen. in spirit and troubled that Lazarus, his friend, has died. He was furious because death still reigned in this world and it has caused destruction in a family. This leads Jesus to weep himself. 
Verse 35, if you look there, that is the shortest verse in the New yeah. Testament. Jesus wept. One thing that I would like you to know, the Greek in this verse, in verse 35, that Jesus wept, is a more particular word. It's a different word used uh, to describe what Mary and the Jews did from what, what they have done. This is a more specific word, and precisely this word means to shed tears. Amen. So it's better to say Jesus burst into tears. And there's no doubt that Jesus was visibly mourning because the Jews around Jesus notices that and say things like, see how he loved him. And in this text, we realize that Jesus is not a heartless monster. God has given us a capacity to grieve and mourn. And Jesus was no different. So what do we conclude from this? There is not a reason for us not to mourn the loss caused by death. And if Jesus is our moral compass, our primary response to those who are mourning is to mourn with them. Yeah. Not demand them to feel joy or prematurely to move on. And this does not change with the sacrifice that Jesus sacrificed with his own body. So we hear from Paul, mourn with those who mourn. That is after Jesus' resurrection as well. It doesn't change with the new covenant signed by his blood. Jesus, in this instance, does not address grief by, felt by Martha and Mary by simply demanding them to have more faith, to be more faithful. You know, as the world throws at us reasons to grieve, reasons to mourn until this world itself is changed, is transformed. And those of us left in this world cannot avoid it and cannot move on from it as long as there exists longing for that person as long as there exists death all we can do is to move forward with that grief carrying it with us so brothers and sisters to those who are mourning i would like to say it is okay to mourn god gave you the capacity to love and as a consequence he also gave you the concept capacity to mourn the loss of your loved one. And it's okay to still miss them after months and years. There isn't something wrong with you. There's something wrong with the world. The world, this world is full of grief. Yes, this does beg a question. And as a labor-intensive experience of grieving and mourning, the fated end for us all, that is, we all know grieving is hard. It's labors. Is that all we can do? That is to ask, does grief have the last word and the inescapable grip on us? Are we doomed to be defeated by and swallowed by death? Is there no hope for us? Certainly not. Certainly not. According to scripture, there seems to be a stark difference between how believers and unbelievers mourn. Hey. So Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, like those who have no hope. I've said earlier that Jesus does not address grief by demanding his followers to be more faithful. Now I've got to add something more on top of that to complete that thought. He does not leave us helpless in grief either. Rather, he removes grief by abolishing and being victorious over death in his own body as to give us hope for our own resurrection. For God, and for God's people, hope and not despair is what qualifies our grief today. Knowing that God will turn grief into joy everlasting. Although we move forward carrying our grief with us, we don't carry it in despair. 
Neither do we move about aimlessly. Yeah, we have a goal. We carry our grief with us until we cross the finish line and we dump that over there by the end. And God will make life spring forward from it. We will witness our grief mended and death removed and life take its place. Today's grief will not prolong forever. Tomorrow it will be turned into joy. There is hope in our grief, not despair. In our text today, Jesus gives Martha, Mary, and those around them the foretaste of what resurrection will look like. In replying to Martha, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is not just about words, is he? But he supplements his words with proof. Let's read John eleven thirty eight 38 through 44 together. Starting in verse 38, then Jesus, angry in himself again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already decaying. It's been four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone that Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Amen. The dead men came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he, saw what he did believed in him. Jesus, by raising Lazarus from the tomb, has demonstrated his authority over life and even death. And made Martha and Mary's hopes of the resurrection of the dead in the last days a living hope. A living hope. Because Lazarus will die again. Mary will die. Martha will die. However, by showing them that Lazarus could be raised again, he gave him a demonstration of the living hope that they would have in Christ Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. Amen. A living hope they can hold on to. For us today, he further demonstrated that what is reserved for us in the end is life and not death. And he did so through the resurrection into the spiritual body in his death, burial, and resurrection. He was raised victorious over death unto life imperishable, unto life immortal. Therefore, for those who belong to him, death no longer has the final say. We have conquered it in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has risen from the dead. And if he has risen, so shall everyone who remains in him. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20, where Paul explains that Christ's resurrection and our resurrection are inextricably tied. And that if Christ's resurrection really did happen and it did, then we will surely be resurrected in the last days as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is without foundation, and so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. 
If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has risen. Amen. 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 And we read further down, starting in verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15. Brothers, I tell you this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and corruption cannot inherit in corruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? In Jesus Christ, we have life. Do you believe that? Amen. We are people with this living hope that we may not falter into the patterns of despair, but into the patterns of hope. Never shall we say death reigns for our living Lord has conquered it. Never shall we be defeated by death for death has lost its venomous sting and it awaits full abolition in the last day. So in conclusion, let us carry our grief patiently to the end, holding on to the living hope we have in Christ Jesus. There, when we deposit our grief, God will wipe away our tears. Grief will be the soil from which joy springs forward. The ones we miss and long for today, we will meet tomorrow. It is a risen Lord we serve, not someone consumed and defeated by death. The Lord is victorious over death, and he is risen. We will, therefore, also see our loved ones risen among us. Today's grief will be your joy tomorrow. So today I invite you in your grief to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. Pray, thy kingdom come. Because where God reigns, there our victory is. Today I invite you to turn yourself over to the risen Lord. Do not be a slave to the power of death and sin any longer. You have an opportunity right now to be freed from it. Come forward to have your desire met in the love of Jesus Christ as we sing together. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He
Maybe I'll be seated. We'd like to thank Jiwoo for the lesson today. It's very, very touching. And um, grief is something I know that all of us have dealt with, or will at some point be something we, we, we will struggle with. Also, today is is, a, is Easter, so we learn of the life and death and the resurrection of our Lord. It's something that is celebrated throughout the world and also tends to be a, an opportunity to reach those people that may have not been reached before or who may not have come to the point where they've taken on Christ. But as we've learned as through today's lesson, in taking on Christ, we, we will grieve but we also have the hope of salvation. And we all know that we will experience the joy of being with Christ and our Lord and our families. So let's, let's think of that as we go into, in, into the, the rest of the day. And as we see above us, there are some prayer requests. We have people that have been struggling with their health, with their spirituality. And we also have those that are dealing with the loss of loved ones. I also like to remember the Jacobs family who's uh, and the Shea Freeze who are uh, both traveling. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for everything that we have in our lives. We know that all the joys we have, all the great things we, we, we are able to accomplish only is through you. Father, we know that only through your son is there the hope of salvation and the hope of eternal life. And as we remember today that sacrifice that he made for us, his life given, and then three days later, the resurrection, the hope that we all now know by living in Christ, we know that we have that opportunity too. Father, as we go into the week and as we go into um, our daily lives, please allow us to remember all those people that we have out there that we know that are either struggling with spiritual or health issues. Continue to be with, with, with them, comfort them, give them whatever it is they need so that they can either get better or come to understand that they, that they need you in their lives and, and come back to you. And fathers, for those who have lost loved ones, continue to comfort them in, in their loss. And as, as we all know through the loss of your son and his resurrection, that ultimately we will be able to see those loved ones again. So there is always that hope and there's that joy of knowing that through you, we have that opportunity. Father, as we go into today and we celebrate your son, Continue to be with all of us and allow us to enjoy and embrace that love that your son has given to us. We ask all this in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.